So you guys, we are in a series right now called This is Where Breakthrough Begins. And make no mistake about it, I'm not talking about this stage or even this building. I'm talking about this right here, this inside of me. When I point to this, I'm also including this, all right? It's all one thing. This is where breakthrough begins. Um, and, and real breakthrough continues getting freedom in your life. Real breakthrough starts right here. And then true freedom in your life is going to be found in other people. It's going to be found relating with other people, getting together with small groups of people and sharing things, sharing life, sharing issues and troubles, like being able to call a great friend and be like, man, I'm going through something. Hey, man, I was going through that two years ago. Let me help you. Let me show you what I did. Let's pray together. Let's do that. Like you only get that through small groups. The, God says, if you confess your sins to me, you, you get healing as far as salvation is concerned. But in the book of James, it says, but when you confess your sins to each other, that's where you get healing in your, in your life, um, is when you confess things and you talk about things. And it's just basically like having a, a good group of buddies, man. It's, it's, it's a band of brothers, basically, brothers and sisters. And so some folks have that in life, but a lot of folks don't have good godly men and women that are your small group, your inner circle, your peeps. And so we provide that here at Revive, a place for you to plug in to small groups of like-minded people that you can connect with. And we call those small groups here at Revive small groups. Um, We're very creative like that, all right? Small groups, all right? So uh, we are going to be launching small groups for the spring season coming up February 19th. So this this season, we're going to extend to uh, two six-week seasons with maybe a break in the middle. And small groups can go, they, they just kind of go however you want them to go, okay? So small group season, though, is February 19th through May 21st, all right? So y'all can write on your calendars. If you're not in a small group, you want to get plugged into a small group, this is when to do it. If you have ever thought about maybe leading a small group, I man, I might want to lead a small group. Well, I don't have any credentials. I didn't go to seminary or whatever. Man, throw all that junk out the window. You do not have to have any credentials to lead a small group. It's just having somebody in your home and going through a a little study or something. I'll even give you the study to go through. It's really easy to lead a small group. If you're interested, contact us and just let me know you're interested. That doesn't mean you have to lead it just because you're interested. You might just want to get some more information about it. So I'll show you everything you need to know if you want to lead a small group. They can be six weeks. Every, every uh, week for six weeks, that's how most of them go. You meet like every Monday for six weeks. You meet for, you know, for an hour, hour and a half or something, and you go through a study together. That's it. Um, some are ongoing. Some groups meet every week all the time, regardless of the, of the, se- the seasons and the semesters. They just constantly meet. Um, and some, some groups meet once a month. Like uh, we got a, a sports small group and a a uh, mountain biking small group and other things like that. The men's breakfast, we, you know, once a month. So small groups are all over the place, but we launch them in the spring, a, a little, little one in the summer, and then a big one again in the fall um, to give folks a chance to step up, get trained. If you want to be a leader, I give you everything you need um, and, and give folks a chance to, to get involved and plugged into a small group that you may not have never been in the small group before. So they sort of are reforming and launching all the time. So this semester, small groups... February 19th through May 21st. All right, you guys, I just wanted to put that bug in your ear because it's, uh, that's the next step of revival. The next step of breakthrough begins here is let's get some real breakthrough with some freedom with some, with some brothers. God can have a breakthrough, but it sure does help if I go sit down and I talk with Ray and talk with John and talk with Brother Billy and, and we work it out together because nine times out of ten, somebody that you talk to has had a very similar issue, and y'all can work it out together. It's awesome how God does that. So we'll be telling you more and more about that to come. All right. Today's message is called The Insight of Revival. If you are taking notes, which I encourage you to do, uh, or take pictures of the screen or something, uh, The Insight of Revival. Last week we had The Sound of Revival. Oh, it was, it was off the chain. It was awesome. I mean, if you hadn't seen it, man, go back and check that out. It was great. Uh, and then uh, we've been talking about different fa- facets of, of revival. And so this week is the insight of revival. And now before we, last week we set the tone, I kind of gave you guys permission to make some noise. Because when, well, actually it wasn't make noise, was it? It was make a sound. There's a difference between sound and noise. Make a, make a sound. Because when you make sounds, 
it creates something. God told us to do that. All throughout Scripture, we see God said, walk around the wall and then yell. And when you scream, the wall comes down. And in Revelation, it, it, the, the seals were broken after the trumpet blast, like sounds and God go hand in hand. Um, and so today we're going to keep that going because it's my belief that when you bring something to God, you bring the totality of the human personality, all right? Which means everything preaches. It's not just me up here preaching. Y'all got to help me preach this sermon. Everything preaches. Every hand clap preaches. Every shout preaches. Every smile ministers to somebody. Every laugh celebrates and preaches the goodness of Godness. All right? Everything that is God, it it, it celebrates the goodness of Godness. So I'm going to give you everything I got today because God is worthy of my greatest. Amen? He's worthy of everything I got. So we're going to start in Numbers. If you got your Bibles, turn to Numbers. All right? Hey, if you don't have your Bibles, don't worry about it. Pull out your phone and look up the Bible app. And if you don't have any of those, I'm going to put all the scriptures right here on the screen, so no sweat. All right, Numbers 13, and we're going to start in verse 30. Say amen when you got it. Amen. All right, here we go. Then Caleb silenced the people before, no, before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of this land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't do it. They said, we can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites this bad report about this land they had explored. They started telling everybody, they're stronger than we are. We can't do it. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are great in size. They're huge. Reminds me of that basketball team we played against yesterday, right, Jet? <laughs> right, Nate? <laughs> we showed up, and the other team was like, poof, like the Nephilim up in there. I was like, daggum, these dudes are huge, man. All right? <laughs> we did good with them, though, but, boy, they were, they were big. All right? The land we explored devours. All the people are great in size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. That's the biggest one right there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Did they call them grasshoppers? No. They seemed like that in their own eyes, and they assumed we looked the same to them. All right? So a revival reintroduces us to God, to new things of God. Re is, is a reenactment, a reintroducing. Revival is the word that we get, revive church comes out of that. It's to relive, vive, uh, right? It's, it's new life. That's what it means. It literally means to be born again or to have your life revived. And a revival, sometimes the process of doing that is learning new things about God and then getting reintroduced to you. It creates in us an appetite that is no longer satisfied with the mediocrity and the mundane. It's just like when you fast. Your appetite changes. Amanda made some pizza for the boys the other night because they're not fasting dinner. And so they were eating dinner. And they left the pizza out on the stove. You know, And you might think, after not having food for so long, I might walk by and be like, Oh, God, it's pizza. It's a pepperoni. But it was the opposite effect. I, I walked by and I looked at him like, oh, 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 that's disgusting. There's just a little grease puddle on that pepperoni and just cheese just all melty off. And it's, blech, it's nasty because your appetite changes. You get cleaned out, you don't want the dirty stuff anymore. Dude, we could camp out on that statement all day long on what that means spiritually. When you clean yourself out, you don't even want the dirty stuff anymore. Dude. Okay, I'm going I'm to keep going. That preaches right there, all right? But it's true for food. God uses food and things to show you lessons about life in other areas, all right? But that's what revival does. It creates a, an appetite. It's no longer satisfied with mediocrity and mundane. You guys, during, during this revival, I've already started looking at, at, at church, doing things different this year, how we can bless people more, or how we can grow, not grow like how many butts can we put in the seats, but 
grow, like how deep can we get? How, how can we grow our leadership? That's what I'm interested in, right? Um, God will grow the number. I ain't worried about growing the number. He wants me to help grow depth and roots. He'll, he'll, he'll produce the fruit. Let's, let's work on the root. Oh, come on. What in the world is going on today up in here? That is just some preaching right there. All right? Somebody write that down. I'm going to forget that. That should be on a T-shirt or bumper sticker or something. All right. Okay, so... Uh, but you guys, I'm not okay with, how, with the mundane and mediocrity anymore. Like, I've been looking at business books. I've, I've got like 10 new book ideas and things like through this, right? Um, because I'm not okay with mediocrity and the mundane. That's what revival does. It brings you back to life. Your visions come back to life. Your dreams come back to life. Your possibilities come back to life. And once you've been exposed, you can't be unexposed. That one right there preaches all day. Yeah, this is a season of reintroductions. God introduces you. Not only does he introduce a new version of God, you see God in a different light, but it introduces you to a new you. Maybe a you that you haven't met yet, a stronger you, a more fortified you, a tougher you, a more peaceful you, a you that stresses less. Come on, somebody. Amen. Mm, amen. A you that praises more. I have been introduced to a new me. It is. One of mine is, it's a, I've, uh, I've never met a Shannon that stresses less. I've never met a Shannon that's okay with not getting it done and produce, 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 produce. I've got to keep going, got to keep going, got to keep going. Get up at 4 o'clock in the morning blah, 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 and have my whole day, day's worth of work done by 10 a.m. I mean, like, that's how I operate. Nah, I was introduced to a new, a new Shannon. And, man, I feel good about it. He's a good guy that don't like pizza. All right? He's a good guy, all right? So that's what revival does. Maybe you've introduced to a, a you that praises more or has more faith in prayer. I think a lot of us that went through this noonday prayer walked away with more faith in prayer. The reason why I say it introduces you to a new you is that during a fast, you draw closer to God and you begin to see Him differently. And you cannot see God differently without seeing yourself differently. All right? So... I'll prove it to you in Scripture. Job 4. No, I'm sorry. Job 42. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want, but I'm going to go quick. So Job 42, verse 5 and 6, it says, My ears had heard you. I've heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. And I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. You can't see him differently and not see you differently. You can't see him bigger and not see you stronger. You can't see him wiser than you ever have before and you not see you as smarter because isn't he in you? If you see God wiser, you got to have the revelation that, man, I'm smarter than I thought. If you see God more powerful than you ever thought before, you got to be feeling like, I'm stronger than I thought. If you see God being able to heal more than you ever thought, you might see yourself being able to help with your relationship. You know, you can't see God differently without seeing you differently because you are in him and he is in you your perception of him impacts the perception of yourself you walk different you talk different you guys you don't run from goliath you run to goliath who is this uncircumcised philistine that dares come against the armies of the most high god you run to the giant you don't run from the giant because you see god that way man somebody called me just this week about this, kind of, about this kind of thing. And I was telling them, I'm like, what we're talking about, this concept, this is why I, I, I feel confident and I, I appear as secure, like there's no insecurity in me at all. I appear that way. Um, trust me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a regular man and have every other issue that everybody else got, but, but I don't walk in it, but it comes, I have it, all right? But one of the reasons why I feel so confident and and... And why I think that I, I am pretty awesome, all right? Now, if you've never sat under my sermons before, like, I, please know that I'm not patting myself on the back. I think God is, to say he's awesome is such an understatement. And if he, I truly believe he's in me. I truly believe that when Jesus ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit like he said he would and he said that if you receive that, you will have the same power that raised me from the dead living in you. Why shouldn't you walk around feeling like you're awesome? 
You should walk around feeling like God did something for you. You sh- does it or does it not say that old things are passed away? Behold, you are a new creation in Christ. I, I am not defined by my past mistakes, man. I'm not defined by my past sins, my past failures, my past scars, my past hurt, or the hurt or scars that I've inflicted on somebody else. Sure, that stuff happened. But what the devil meant to destroy you with, God is so powerful. He doesn't just erase it and wipe it away and clean from you. That wouldn't be as powerful as God is. He could do that. But instead, he actually takes the stuff that the devil meant to destroy you with and uses that stuff to make you stronger. Just absolutely demolishing the devil. <laughs> the devil is like, man, I, I thought that was going to work. I thought for sure that would, that would rip Tony apart. I thought that was for sure what would get James. Oh, man, I know what will get Hudson. And, he might, and, and you might get all these fiery darts fired at you. And God could say, you know what, that's my, that's my son, that's my daughter. I'm just going to make that. You don't even remember it anymore. I'm just going to wipe that up. But he does even better than that. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to use that stuff, and I'm going to make you stronger, make you better, make you quicker, make you wiser, make you smarter. And I'm going to make you a minister of my word so that you can go out and share it with other people. And so the ripple effect continues. Meanwhile, the devil looks at all that and goes, man, that backfired. This reintroduction of you to you, it's not just for excitement. It's for your assignment. Purpose requires that you have a proper perception of you. If you're going to walk out your purpose, you've got to have a proper perception of you. Because the course and quality of our life is not just determined by how we see God, but it's equally impacted by how we see ourselves. Okay, so some of this stuff... Is well, like I thought on it a lot, and so some of you got to lean in and focus with me because because um, it, it I focused on it a lot. I've already had a lot of time with it, so if I if I say something too quick, um, go back and watch it later, text me or something and catch it. And um, so anyway, so our effectiveness to serve God and grow His kingdom is one hundred percent predicated by our elevation as individuals, and our elevation as individuals is predicated by our insight what do you see when you look in so going in reverse what you see when you look in is going to determine your elevation as an individual person and your elevation as an individual person is going to directly affect your impact on growing the kingdom of God if what you see when you look in is about this big do you think you're ever going to be bold enough to go walk up to somebody and pray you feel this big. You feel like a grasshopper. And so you won't even go into the land. I'm telling you, <laughs> the insight of revival is very important. How you see yourself. And, and some, some Christians you know, may, may buck me on this and be like, well, we're supposed to be others-focused. We're supposed to be others-focused and grow in the kingdom of God. Of course. I'm not saying that we're not. But... If you ain't no good, you ain't no good to nobody else. I know that is not proper English, right? My sister is not in the room today, right? Matter of fact, she's at an education conference, so she can get even smarter and come back and and critique me even more on how I talk from this stage. Uh, But it's like when you're on an airplane and they tell you, when the oxygen masks come down, you're supposed to give it to the person next to you first? No. You breathe first and then give it to the person next to you. Why? Because you're no good to anybody if you pass out. Your kiddos are sitting around, i got to save my children. i got to... <laughs> your kids are on their own. I'm assuming it's talking about... First time I ever heard that, they didn't, they didn't say if your children are riding with you. They said just somebody next to you. I'm like, look here. I'm a pretty nice guy, but I don't know this person. It, you don't have to tell me to breathe first and then pass it. <laughs> like, I don't know you. All right. Anyway. All right, so... <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, so let me ask you something. Do you see a grasshopper? When you look in, do you see a grasshopper or do you see a giant? If you take a note, write that one down because you need to think on that one. And be honest with yourself. 
if you see a grasshopper, you got some work to do. And it's okay that you do see a grasshopper. It's just not okay to stay there. I used to see a grasshopper when I looked in, but I don't no more. I don't anymore. I try to clean up my grammar. I don't see a grasshopper when I look inside. I see a mighty, mighty giant when I look inside. But apart from me, you, are, you have nothing, says Jesus. I don't see me being all that. But when I look in, I see God. And I see everything that he's, I see Godness. All the characteristics that make up our king. All of this word. The more I read this word, the more he becomes real to me. Therefore, the more powerful I become because this is right there. This lives right there. It lives right here. And so the more I study it, the more I believe, the more strength that I've got. If you see a grasshopper, there are some battles you won't even fight because you're not seeing in right. You're, you're not seeing correctly when you see in. You won't even fight the battle. I don't even, my, my marriage is too far gone. Well, that's not what God says. No, I'll never get promoted. We're always going to be poor. What? Where's that? Where, what? Uh, I know I... I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to make you stay in poverty your whole life. That's not what that says. Prosper you. All right? Blessings, you guys. No. Okay. All right. Let's move on. I believe God is doing something for us right now in this Code Red revival that's going to help us see right. In other words, I'll go as far as my sight lets me see. You're going to go as far as your sight Let's you see. You will never elevate higher in your life than where you believe you can go. Now, this, stay focused on Scripture here. Some of this stuff might sound like some motivational message or something like that, but this, it's not. I'm telling you, the insight of what's in here should 100% be a reflection of God, and unfortunately, a lot of times, it's not. When we look in here, we don't see a giant. We see a grasshopper. But God has imparted into us the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to start seeing ourselves differently. Amen? you got to. you got to start seeing yourself. If you're going to be incredibly valuable to the world, be attractive to the world, to draw them in, to grow the kingdom of God, if you're going to be valuable to your kids, kids, if you're going to be valuable to your parents, to your friends, to your schools, you've got to see yourself as valuable. Unfortunately, some of our value is on the floor, but that is not who God says you are. God's word says, everybody say God's word says. God's word says says he has plans for us, full of hope, full of faith, full of love. God's word says he views us as his masterpiece. And he says we are royalty, having been adopted into his kingdom. God's word says says, that you have the power to take every thought captive and command it to fall under the obedience of God. Man, I didn't say that. God's word says, says, if you drink from my well, you'll never thirst again. God's word says... If you give your mind over and give your tongue over to the Holy Spirit, he will give you a power that's even greater than me. That's what God's word says. It don't matter what you think. That's what God's word says. It don't matter what the world says. What does the word say? It don't matter what your teacher, your coach it don't matter what your past boyfriend or your girlfriend or the... don't matter what they called you. God's word says you're royalty. But I've never fit in anywhere. I'm lonely. But God's word says he sets the lonely in family. God's word says you are my child and you belong to this family. So God's word says the truth, but could it be that God will allow us to live 
on whatever level we settle for. It's, it's true. Because God doesn't make you love Him. He allows you to live on whatever level you settle for. That is powerful. Which means, whatever level you've settled for, you settled for. I refuse to settle for good when my God is great. Come on. Could it be that he is truly a shepherd who simply leads and expects us to follow? But does the sheep have to follow the shepherd? No. Mm -mm. He leads us, but he doesn't make you come. You get to pick whatever level you want to settle for. Could it be that your level of elevation in your life is up to you and based on your perception of yourself? You guys, it, not could it be. I guarantee you it is. And God wants to reintroduce you to you. Come on. He wants to reintroduce you to you. Like, hey, Jermaine, I want to introduce you to somebody. This is Jermaine. You guys should meet. And you should kill that old guy. <laughs> Jermaine's the first one to clap because he knows how vile that old guy was, right? No, his wife was the first one to clap. <laughs> Tab's like, come on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that old guy don't do nothing but lay on the couch and put his feet up. Let's kill that guy. Pick up a vacuum. No, that's funny. All right. God wants to reintroduce you to you. You guys, I'm, I'm picking on Jermaine, but you guys, I killed my old man a long time ago. I don't want that guy in my life no more. You know, I see people from, from way back when. You know, back in the day. Man, I ain't seen this dude in a minute. What's up, bro? How you been? And we come up, we're talking. I hate it when somebody says, man, what's up, Pitt? You ain't changed a bit. I'm like, what? I ain't changed a bit. Man. I would rather somebody come up and be like, man, I don't even recognize you. You got such a glow on you, Shannon. <laughs> so you guys... Let's move on. The text today started in Numbers, but really, we're going to go back to Exodus now. Um, I, there'll be a couple of scriptures here, but basically, I just want you to get the gist of it. We're going to explore the story of Moses freeing the nation of Israel from the slave captivity of the Egyptians. All right? So, the Israelite nation been enslaved by Egypt for hundreds and hundreds of years, and Moses comes to free them, and they make an exit from Egypt, and that's why we get the word Exodus. I love that word. I love the title of this because God provided an exit for the Israelite people who had been living in this captivity. God is the God of exits, and it's very important somebody came into this house today to know that God is the God of exits because you are in a season right now you desperately need to exit from. God is the God of exits. And if God is the God of exits, what that means is... I'm never trapped. You ever felt trapped? You ain't trapped because God is the God of exits. You may feel trapped. Oh, it may look trapped. But if God is the God of exits, he's got to part the Red Sea. He's the God of exits. He'll part the Red Sea for me to get me where I need to be. You guys, he will provide a way for you to go from where you are now to where he wants you to be. But you got to line up where he wants you to be is also where you want to be. And he is the God of exits. And where there seems to be obstacles in the way, he supernaturally removes those obstacles from you. Now, check this out. God didn't provide an exit for the Israelites until they asked him to. They asked him. Now, listen, this is really important. You guys lean in, check it out, all right? How they asked and how this went down is so vitally important for us to get today. It's going to help somebody. I know it is. 
They had a problem. The Israelite nation had a problem. We've been in captivity for a long time. We're being tortured. We're suffering, and we want to be set free. They talked to God, and then God talked to Moses about their problem. They had a problem. They talked to God, and then God talked to Moses. Okay? They had a problem. They talked to God, and God talked to Moses. But so many times in our lives, when we talk to God, we are under the false expectation that we personally should hear from God immediately on this subject. But sometimes you talk to God, and God talks to somebody else to line stuff up for you that's better for you than you can possibly imagine. None of them could do anything about getting themselves out of captivity. But God knew, but there's one guy that can just because you take a problem to God and he doesn't talk back to you doesn't mean he's not working on the answer. And you got to know he's working on it. He's working on it. They had a problem. They talked to God. And then God talked to Moses. And you guys, we need to understand it. This identifies a problem with sometimes how we talk to God. Or actually, it's maybe not the problem of us talking to God. It's how we react when we don't think God is talking back to us. Israel is in this season of feeling like God isn't listening, like they're abandoned and, and, and even hopeless. They don't see that there's hope. And where there's no hope, there's no strength because there's no powerful insight. When they look inside, they don't see any hope. They see no power at all. But little did they know, Moses was on the way. We can feel abandoned and unheard, and then all of a sudden, Moses shows up. Just like that. And and Moses didn't know his whole backstory. He really didn't. He just knew that his mother gave him up, and and he didn't know that, that she gave him up because his life was in danger. She just, I mean, imagine growing up, like your mom gave you up. And you didn't know that it was for a noble reason. You just thought your mom abandoned you and left you. So he just knows that he was raised in Pharaoh's temple. But he never really felt like he fit in. Now, this is where I start identifying with this story. And I don't know if some of y'all do too, but boy, I sure do. Because Moses didn't ever feel like he fit in. He was too Hebrew to be Egyptian. He's too Egyptian to be Hebrew. He never felt, he never fit in. He felt awkward his whole life. But he later realized that awkwardness wasn't really awkwardness. It was uniqueness. And God can use uniqueness in a very powerful way. But awkwardness is something that we feel about this big over. Sometimes you got to wait for life to catch up, for some maturity to have some revelation to realize why you felt awkward in in a previous season. Because listen to this. Because what made you awkward in one season makes you relevant in the next. What makes you awkward in this season, that's exactly what validates you in the next season. It's because you went through addiction that you are now relevant in your next season to speak on addiction, to help others through addiction, to be so strong. I went through some of the worst pain in my life before Amanda and I started dating with the girlfriend previous to her. I mean, it was just one of the worst pains. I wouldn't wish that pain on my worst enemy, man. It's the worst pain ever. And I would do it all over again because it taught me the strength that I have in me to make it through adversity. It it taught me that even though I felt painful and odd and weird and awkward and one more time, don't feel like I fit in with anybody, That's the thing that made me relevant in the next season. It's the lessons learned from the pain that produced my purpose. God starts engaging in this conversation with Moses. He really gives Moses a preview of his purpose. Purpose is what you've been created to do, but the calling is the invitation to accept the assignment. Okay, so purpose is is what you've been created to do. And we've, we've all got that purpose and we help, if you don't know what your purpose is, we'll help, help you find what your purpose is. That's what, that's what Growth Track 
is. We'll help you find it. It's ultimately up to you to seek that, but we'll nudge you in the right direction, show you in the scriptures where it talks about it. And then maybe you'll feel called to, to accept that assignment. Calling is the invitation to accept the assignment. So check this out. When, when, when God, this is so, this is so beautiful. This is how, how, this is how we, we do it all the time. And Moses did it, you know, hook, loud, and sinker. When God extends his invitation to Moses, Moses responds with his inadequacy, doesn't he? Moses responds with, uh, you got the wrong guy. I can't do this. God, what are you doing? You coming up here burning bushes? Stop all that. I'm doing fine. I don't need all of that. Starting fires and stuff in the wilderness. No, I'm fine. But you got to see this. His response to God's opportunity was a reflection of the inadequacy, inadequacy that only lived in his mind. So when, when God gave him his assignment, I want you to go free the, the Israelite people. He was like, I, I'm not your guy. I stutter when I speak. I've got a speech impediment. I'm not a speaker. I'm not eloquent with my words. I can't do this. I'm not the right guy. His response of inadequacy is because of how he saw himself in his own mind. But that's exactly what God was looking for. (laughs) See, Moses thought, I'll tell you what I mean by that. God was looking for that, so check it out. So so he thought his inadequacy should exempt him from the assignment. We could stop right there as well. How many of us don't do the assignment... Because when we have our insight, when we look inside, we don't see a giant, we see a grasshopper. We therefore exempt ourselves from the assignment. Hey, Shannon, I want you to go pray for those people over there. And your mind starts spinning with all these inadequacies. No, I'm not your guy. Somebody else could pray for them. Well, I'm not very, I don't speak very well and blah, 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 blah. And so we think that exempts us from the assignment. But did it exempt Moses from God's assignment? On the contrary, where Moses thought his inadequacy should exempt him from God's assignment, God sees that as assurance of Moses' reliability. Moses said, I can't do this. And God said, exactly. Moses said, I'm not your guy. There's no way I can pull this off. And God said, I know that. That's why I picked you. Because I know that you know you don't believe that you can do it. So if you know that I know that you can't do it, I know it's going to be all me. God says, I know that you know. Therefore, I know that what you do will be all me. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. I know that you'll listen to me. I know that you'll obey me. I know that you will grab my power every morning when you wake up because I know that you know you can't do it on your own. And that's what I'm looking for. One word that sums that up is humility. Humility before the Lord and and confessing, God, I can't do it. Like men have the hardest time with this because we're so prideful. Man, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. All right? I don't need your help. I don't need, mm, I can do it. But true power is when you realize, no, I can't do it. I need to call upon the king of all kings to do this through me. And that's what God was looking for. <laughs> God said, exactly. So Moses says, okay, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go down and I'm going to tell Israel that I'm going to set them free. And I'm going to tell Pharaoh, I've come to set, set my people free. If I'm going to do this, I need to know who it is that's sending me, God. Because I can't just say God sent me because this is a polytheistic culture. And they got lots of gods. You can't just say God sent me. So Moses says to God, what is your name? Tell me what to say when they say, who who sent you? He said, all right, God, what is your name? So he got ready to write it, write down. What is your name? He probably took out his phone and he's like, go to his notes app. And he's like, all right, what, what do we, okay. So God says, I am. So can you see Moses? writing stuff down. He's like, okay, I, space, am, space. And, he's not it, I am. I am that I am. I am what I am. I am blank. <laughs> Meaning, Moses, you have no idea 
how much you're going to need me to be in your life. Right now, there's not a name that I can give you that adequately articulates what I will be for you. So right now, I'm just going to give you an I and an M and a blank. And whenever you get to a situation where you need something or someone, you insert it into that blank. How many of you guys know that we serve a God that says, fill in the blanks? I am. You fill in the blank whatever you need God to be for you. That's how he does things. God, I need healing right now. God says, I am the healer. God, I, I need strength right now, man. I feel so weak. God says, I am strong. God, I need humility right now. Help me. I am humble. God, I need power right now. I am powerful. God, I need comfort right now. I am comfort. God, I just need direction. I am the way. Man, I am the direction. God doesn't waste pain. When you're moving from this season into the next, God reintroduces you to you, and he will take pain and produce purpose. And you need to know that your season of suffering was not for nothing. You're not going to leave this season empty-handed, okay? So I'm, I'm going somewhere with all of this. So Exodus 3.21, it says, And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you'll not leave empty-handed. This is crazy to them. They're slaves. They're slaves by the Egyptian people. They have nothing. And God, Moses comes from God's message. says, not only am I going to free you, you're going to be favorable in the eyes of the Egyptians, and they're going to give you wealth as you leave. You're not leaving empty-handed. You're not leaving out of your season with nothing. This season of suffering that you've been going through, God says, I want to add something to it. It ain't going to be for nothing. Very often, we, we celebrate what we came out of. I think the question we need to ask is, what did we leave with? Man, Pastor John was talking about fasting. And just like everybody else, I, I, when we first start, I ask people, what are you fasting? What are you fasting? Pastor John pointed something out. He's like, man, you know, when we, when we do that, we're asking people, hey, what are you choosing to do without? But rather, why don't we ask, what are you hoping to leave with? What are you f not fasting from? What are you fasting for? Isn't that a much better conversation that leads us to the power of God and the spirituality of why we fast in the first place? Who cares if you're cutting out noodles? Who cares? That, well, I'm not having sugar. Uh, okay. What's going to happen in replace of that? What are you fasting for? What are you believing for? What are you hoping for? What are you walking out of your season being left with? That's the question. All right, I, I came out of this storm. Okay, but what did I leave with? Did you leave with wisdom? Did you leave with strength that you didn't have before? Did you leave with perspective? These are the things we should write down when we're in the, in the storms and when we come out of storms. Did, what, do you, what did you leave with? What is the value that came out of this? That's the stuff you should focus on. That's the stuff that is revival. That is the new you. That's the new you that you're walking out of there with. I'm more wise than I was when I walked into this. I have a better perspective. Did you come out of it with something of great value so you can look back on it like David did and say, it was good that I was afflicted, that I might learn from your statutes. Some of the greatest lessons that we ever learn in life come out of our toughest seasons. And y'all have heard me say it this way before. I've said it already. Our greatest pain. Through our greatest pain, God reveals our greatest purpose. So if you're going to suffer... Man, leave with something. Find the value, the gift, the jewel, the treasure. Because I promise it's there. God is the God of exits. He's not going to send his people away with nothing. And imagine how much he loved the, the nation of Israel. How much greater he loves the people of his son Jesus. So he says this in, in Exodus chapter 3. That they're, they're not going to leave empty-handed. They're going to leave with gifts. They're going to have wealth when they leave. They're going to be favorable in the eyes of the Egyptians. He says it in chapter 3. Everybody say chapter 3. <laughs> chapter 3. But in Exodus chapter 12 is when it actually happens. Not verse 3 to verse 12. Chapter 3 to chapter 12. In chapter 12, in verse 36, it says, The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. So here, here comes the fruition 
that took a minute. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. Do you know how wealthy the Egyptians were? And the Israelites left with this treasure. God says it in chapter 3, but it doesn't happen until chapter 12. So the time of announcement is not always the time of fulfillment. The test for Israel was, can they endure chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11? These are all the plagues that he sent that didn't work. Plague after plague after plague after plague. Bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff. It's not working, God. It's not working, God. It's not working, God. Continue, 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 continue. Finally, in chapter 12, the favor fell and the wealth went with them. Oh, we rejoice in chapter 3 when God tells us something. But you might have to wait a few chapters. But God was faithful to his word back then and he's faithful to his word now. The test of faith. Now, check it out, you guys. There's another. Lean in and grab this. Okay, the test of faith is not just in the enormity of the obstacle, but the test of faith is also found in the length of the wait. You get that? Like, it's not just how big you can believe, but can you keep on believing? That's the test of faith. It's not this obstacle is so big. It's not just found in the enormity of the obstacle. This is huge. I'll give you a perfect example, just real quick. When Amanda and I were going through the worst season of our life, and we were a thread away from getting divorced. It was a mountain we've never faced before. The obstacle was enormous, but the enormity of the obstacle wasn't the complete test. It took us five years, five years to finally, to build that back. And I told the Lord when it first started, I'll never love her again. And it took a while, but I'll never forget the day. She got out of the car and walked in front of the car, heading into Target or something, all right? And I just, my, my butterflies in my stomach lined back up. And they went, <laughs> and I was like, whoa. And she started walking, and I, I just started crying. I'm like, I am head over heels in love with her. And I looked up at God, and I went, <laughs> you said, you said you would do it. I didn't think you was going to do it, because I knew it wasn't nothing that I did. But that took a minute, man. The enormity of the obstacle is not the only place that you're being tested. It's also the length of the wait. Now, that's for somebody in here today that's in a season of waiting. So they did let the, let the Israelites go. So there's a great, there's a cool finish to this story, you guys. Hang with me, all right? So check it out. They let them go. Israelites are on the move. They got the treasure. The Egyptians change their mind and then go after them. The Egyptians are like, well, we changed our mind. I want the treasure back. I want the people back. Never mind. So Moses is leading them, and then where do they come to? The Red Sea. Boom. They're stuck. They're trapped. The Red Sea's in front of them. They can't cross. Bearing down on their rears is the Egyptian army, the greatest fighting force on the planet. They feel trapped, but God is the God of exits. And I love this part because the people started complaining to Moses. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then the text says something really, really funny. So the text says that Moses says to them, when they say, Moses, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He, go, he, he goes, stand still and you'll see the salvation of the Lord. And then Moses turns around and asks God, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. So now we know the story. Moses stretches out his staff, and the Red Sea begins to part. So I've been in church my whole life, and we all know because we watch movies that when he stretches out his staff, the sea just goes, and they walk through on dry land. That's what Charlton Heston did. That's what all movies, that's what Jim Carrey did in The Little Bowl of Soup. And Bruce Almighty, that's how it happened, right? That's not how it happened. That's not how it happened. The text says, everybody say, but the text says, but God says, which means the truth is, you know how many times when they asked Jesus something, he began his 
Answer with, it is written. What that means is, you might be thinking this, but God says, the text says, which means you might think this, but the truth is, Exodus 14, 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night, everybody say all that night, all that night, the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. What? You mean he didn't go, dun, 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 and they started across? No. All that night. You mean Moses held out his staff and what he was praying for didn't immediately happen? That's right. We think it needs to be immediately, don't we? If I pray for it, heal it, boom, let's go. Marriage is messed up. Do one thing, fixed. But that's not really usually how things work out in the natural because that's not really how God made them work out in the Word either. All night long. <laughs> the text says... All night long. We want the healing immediately, though. We want the relationship mended immediately. We want the freedom to happen immediately. Our expectations of immediately are not always aligned with the truth of God's Word. And where there are false expectations, you are left with real frustrations. But you got to be knowing that you, you might be in a season. You have to know. Let me rephrase that. you got to be knowing. That ain't right. You got to know that the wind is blowing. Man, does anybody in here know that you serve a God who it may not look exactly like what you think it should look like? You may be facing a wall of water, but is there anybody in here that knows that the wind of God is blowing? The wind of God is blowing. You got to believe that. And nothing is, nothing is for nothing in the Bible. When it says they walked across on dry land, that also tweaks my ear. Just because the, the waters retract, don't make the land dry. You ever been to the beach? That sand isn't dry. And so why, why is it dry? It's not supposed to be dry. It's supposed to be muddy. So just think about something for a minute, okay? And this is, this is like just a, what might have been going on. This is a holy hypothesis. Okay, what might have been meant, God might have meant this by this. And don't get all religious on me and be like, oh, now he's fixing to just put his own translation on the Bible. We're supposed to dive deep into the word. What did that parable mean? And go and seek it and find it out. Jesus gives example after example of this. Like it doesn't use the word pornography in the Bible. But I'm pretty sure when Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, even in your heart, you've committed adultery. Oh, it don't... It says don't get drunk on wine. It don't say nothing about tequila. <laughs> tequila must be okay. I mean, come on. You, like, so this is what we're supposed to do. Don't get religious on me. You walked into a church today. We're not legalistic and we're not religious. All right? We value the truth over tradition. All right? So what might have been going on? Why did he say it was dry land? Maybe. Because when you walk through mud, you leave tracks. Mud leaves tracks. I can tell where you've been if you've just walked through mud because you still got mud on you. But that's not how God works. The Apostle Paul said that the passing through of the Red Sea was a metaphor for baptism. And baptism is a metaphor for the cleansing work that God does on the inside. You are washed clean. There's no evidence of your past mud and your past dirt when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you are washed clean. You don't walk through mud. You walk through dry ground. It would not be a, an appropriate analogy if they walked through mud and tracked it wouldn't up line up with the rest of God, so he made it dry land. Maybe. Maybe. I think so. I mean, that's how my God works. Isn't that cool to think about stuff like that? Man, every detail in the Bible is there for a reason. Seek it out. Check it out. Maybe it could be. Man. It 
Let me grab this one. All right, I got two more microphones over there. We're gonna run these batteries out, then we're gonna run them out too. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, woo, preach it. Others y'all are like, is he for, is he for real? Is he? Come on, man, it's Family Sunday. These kids are getting on my nerves. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm messing with you. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Hey guys, we, we're, fin we're finishing up. Uh, let's just get some keys today. Let's get some keys. And we're going to finish up. All right. Aren't you excited that you don't look like what you've been through? Man, I am cleansed. I'm redeemed and I'm made whole. Man. So these folks are redeemed. They're, they're made whole again. And you guys, are, this is for a different, I, I don't know what season you're in, so I gotta, I gotta speak to all these seasons. Once they are redeemed and they have new hope, where are they, the, the new hope is the promised land, the land of Canaan, and that's where they're headed. And that's gonna bring us back to the first scripture we started with, with which is Numbers. And so they go to the edge of the land of Canaan, the promised land. Now they're redeemed. God did all this stuff for them. He sent these plagues. He made favor fall upon them. He sent them away with the Egyptians' wealth, man. He did exceedingly and abundantly more than they could ever have imagined or asked for. He did it for them. And they get to the edge of the land. They send 12 people over. 10 of them come back and say, we can't go no further. And they convince everybody to stop right there. They left where they were, so where they are is not as bad as where they were, but it's not as good as where God wants to take them. And so many of us stop just short. He got rid of the dirtiest dirt, and we stop just short. But the promised land is just on the other side. But they didn't go any further because when they looked inside, they saw the grasshopper. And it just blows my mind after all God did for them. What? How can you not? He, did, he parted the sea. He destroyed the army for you. You can't destroy the army. He did it for you. You can't get yourselves out of captivity. He did it for you. After all God did for them, now they're wealthy. After all God did for them, how can they make that choice of not believing in the power of God? How can they make that choice? It answers that for us. If you ever wonder, how do people do this? God did so much for you. How do you go back to your old ways? How do you still believe you're unworthy? It tells us right here in the text. Numbers 13, 33. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. The problem wasn't how they saw God. The problem was how they saw themselves. Clearly they see God as this, he did all that, he, he freed them, he made them wealthy, he, he got rid of the army, he, he saved them. The problem was, even though they saw God do all this stuff, they didn't level up their own insight as to who God is for them on the inside and how powerful they are. They said there are giants in the land. They saw the giants accurately, but they saw themselves inaccurately. I'm not telling you today there's not giants in your life. There are. You can call it what it is. It's going to be tough to fix your relationship. It's going to be tough to start that business. It's going to be tough to read the Bible every day this year and get through the Bible in one year. It's going to be tough. There's giants. It's going to be hard to overcome this season where you got a bad report from the doctor. There are giants in the land. You can identify them accurately. But don't inaccurately identify your insight as a grasshopper. These people back then had the power to move into the promised land. We will see that later if we keep reading. How much more do we have today? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. We've got something that doesn't just walk beside us. We got something that walks inside us. And if you didn't get anything else from this message today, 
get this, you can do it. The only reason why I share my fasting with you is to encourage you. Man, if I can do it, you don't think it was, it was hard? No food for 21 days? If I can do it, I'm standing here before you. Do I look low on energy? Do I look unhealthy? Do I look like I had a problem with this? If I can do it, you can do it. Our marriage was a threat away from divorce. If we can do it, you can do it. We were so broke one time, I got a job and didn't have enough money to get gas in the car to get to the job. But if, if I can do it, you can do it. Because we serve the same God. And the world might say, your credit is laughable. The world might say, it's a joke you're as old as you are and as small as your bank account is. The world might say, your relationship will never recover from that. But God says, the truth is, that's where you got to go. See, they didn't lose to the giant. They lost to the lie of the inaccurate thought of the grasshopper. The giant didn't beat them. The grasshopper beat them. The problem is not the giants that are out there. The problem is the grasshopper that's in here. Three things. Identify the lie. Reintroduce the truth. And seal the promise with truth after truth. We've done this this whole sermon. What's the lie the enemy's been telling you? I don't know your lie. That's up to you. Identify it though. Don't sweep it under the rug. What is that nagging junk that just won't quit? What is that thing in your life? What's the lie? Identify it. Now what's the truth? But, but what does the Bible say? What does God's word say? And don't just find one truth. Find two truths. Find three truths. Five truths. Ten truths. Eleven truths. If you're having problem finding truths, just open this thing up and start reading and if you want to get real specific with it, start in Ephesians 1 and read through Ephesians 2. Chapter 1 and 2 of Ephesians will tell you exactly who God says you are. Amen. Amen, you guys. Thank y'all for giving me a little extra time today. I figure since they don't have kids in the kids' church, they're not on a schedule in there. We could keep you a minute more. So I hope y'all enjoyed this message to you today. This is not a message from Shannon. This is one that God delivered to his people today because he first delivered it to me come on let's stand up and let me close y'all out in prayer and hey if y'all don't know the drill we end every service with an opportunity for you to pray so we'll we'll, we'll dismiss i'm going to pray for you but we'll dismiss in a minute but those of you that would like extra prayer please come down and get prayer brother ray and the whole altar team is going to be lined up here these folks are full all prayed up and where you might not know how to pray or be empty or feeling, uh, they're going to pour out on you, okay? So if you need that today, just hang when we dismiss. Just, just hang and then just sort of make your way up. Don't walk out of God's house without getting the prayer that you need. Because where there is prayer, there is power. Amen. Hallelujah. Look, I don't know your struggle. So I can't pray for every individual person. Okay, so God is the God of exits. And God says, I am blank. He's the God of the blanks. You fill in the blank, and he will walk you through your exit into your next season. And however you thought you felt like you didn't fit in, what made you awkward in this season will make you relevant in the next. God will take everything the devil meant to destroy you with and flip it around and make it work for him. Come on, let's take it to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we praise you today. We love you. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this worship. We thank you for the testimonies that came forth today. Father God, you see all the hearts standing for you today. In Jesus' name and all the ones that are watching online. In Jesus' name, Lord God, I don't know the lies. But, but church family, you do. And I just, I just ask you right now, just lift them to God. Just say them in the privacy of your heart. Say them out loud. God, this is what I been told this is the lie that's been been spinning in my head call it out but God I promise 
And I vow, as I stand before you now, to seek the truth. And the truth shall set me free. And it is for freedom that Christ died to set me free. And God, I seek that freedom from these lies. The truth is, I am more than a conqueror. The truth is, I am worthy. The truth is, I was chosen. The truth is, I am adopted into sonship. The truth is, you love me. The truth is, out of all the things that you've created in this world, you call me your masterpiece. The truth is, you're not done yet in my life. The truth is, I am healed. The truth is, my marriage will not fall to the wayside. The truth is, what God has joined together, let no man put us under. The truth is, I am a child of the Most High God. The truth is, no weapon formed against me will ever prosper. The truth is, my God is the Alpha. My God is the Omega. Everything starts and everything stops with my God. And the truth is, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And this is where breakthrough begins. And this is the insight of revival. And now when I look on the inside, my giant squishes that grasshopper. I will no longer be bound to a small grasshopper mentality. Create in me a new creation, a new perspective, a giant mentality, a lion's mentality. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we all walk out of here unafraid to roar now that we've been introduced to a new us. In Jesus' mighty and holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some love. Praise you, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Father God. Have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name, you guys are dismissed. Love you guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it blessed you. If it did, would you do me a favor? Would y'all just share this? Because when you share it, it just helps it to grow and more people get to see it. And also subscribe. When you subscribe, it helps the channel grow, helps to get the, the, the reach out there and, and just keep growing the kingdom of God. So subscribe to this channel, hit those notification things so you're always updated when we upload something new and share this with as many people as possible. Hope this blessed you guys. Y'all have a wonderful day. See you next time. Bye.